Hey everybody, Ryan Doyle, Vertigree Table, D&D Essentials Kit, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, Dwarven Excavation. When your players first start in the town of Bandolin, there will be three adventures waiting on that job board for them. We tackled the smallest one, Umbridge Hill, in that last video, and next time we'll talk about the largest, which is also the weirdest and the wildest, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that and the rest of this Dungeon Master Prep series. But this one is all about Dwarven Excavation, potentially the deadliest of the starter quests. So we're going to want to be prepared here. Now, in theory, this might actually be the shortest and safest one of these quests, as the party just has to go and warn these dwarven prospectors that there's a dragon in the neighborhood, and they'll get their 50 gold. They don't even have to bring them back to town like last time, supposedly. Now, if we weren't in love with that whole job board mechanic, and or we wanted to get her more involved in the story, I think this is a good quest for Halia Thornton over at the Miner's Exchange to be interested in. Maybe she's the one offering the reward, or offering an additional reward and a little side quest action for returning with an artifact from the dig or information or evidence of what exactly was going on inside this ancient settlement. Maybe she's looking for Wave Echo Cave, and or these prospectors are actually Rockseeker brothers. Though as written, Dazzlin and Norbus are potentially a lot of fun. One is forthright and honest, while the other is gruff and excessively cautious, and they banter like an old married couple. Perfect. <laughs> See, it doesn't take a lot to round out NPCs and give them some character. Just a couple details and some motivation. It's easy to imagine these two spending the last few months alone, together, digging through all this rubble looking for treasure, and so far they've found nothing, except for some ochre jellies, that is. It's also not hard to imagine what they'll be talking about when the player characters find them eating and watching the entrance to that temple, should they go back in there. Our heroes come along just in time to get invited to clear this place out for them. All for the pretty sweet reward of a pair of sending stones, fantasy walkie-talkies essentially that may come in handy later, and also half of the treasure that's sure to be waiting inside. Now, as far as the treasure waiting inside this ancient temple filled with secret doors, this quest feels a little stingy to me. We do get 150 gold pieces worth of gems in a secret compartment filled with skulls, so that's nice. Plus we get that 50 gold piece necklace that says greed is good on it. Turns out this evil dwarven god was actually Ronald Reagan. But all in all, it feels like there should be more in here. I would consider making the two sets of red vestments not worthless, but actually studded leather armor, and for bonus points, describe them as like pretty kick-ass looking. I'd also pepper in some silvered weapons in here, as it kind of makes sense, right? For a cult of greed that was performing blood sacrifices to have precious metal blades, and we need to give the players the opportunity to be prepared for the wear rats in a later adventure. If they just sell this stuff, and some of them can't do anything in the mountain toe mine later, that's okay. We just want to give them the chance. It's good game design. But before anybody is getting anything, they're going to have to get through these ochre jellies. Once again, we are getting monsters capable of killing all of our newly minted first level characters easily. If the party did hit Umbridge Hill on the way here, and maybe we encourage them to do so, then they're going to be level 2 and a bit more durable, but still, that pseudopod hits for 2d6 plus 2 bludgeoning and another d6 of acid damage on top of that, so we might be one-shotting characters here. Roll high enough, and it might even be instant death. No death saves, nothing. That's extra likely if this thing literally gets the drop on somebody falling from the ceiling unseen and getting advantage on its attack roll on an unwary character. Man, this thing crits, and we're talking about, what, 36, 38 points of damage. That probably won't happen, though. It'll probably just hit the tankiest character for 12 on average, and then they are going to swing their longsword or great axe when it's their turn and do nothing other than split this thing. So now it's going to get two attacks next round. Bananas. Now, part of me loves this, though. D&D should be bananas. The PCs will be pretty much unstoppable soon enough, so enjoy this low-level play as much as I do. But at the same time, we don't want to kill everybody right away, especially with new 
players. So let's talk about our options. First, whatever the party size, I wouldn't start with two, but bring them in one at a time. In case it turns out one is enough, too much. Uh, Mike Shea over at Sly Furish of Lazy Dungeon Master fame suggested replacing these ochre jellies with gray oozes. And I really like this suggestion because I really like gray oozes. They're one of the few monsters out there that damage the player character's equipment. Hit that character sheet. It also dovetails nicely with trying to outfit the PCs with silvered weapons in here. And man, that moment when a player first realizes hitting this thing actually damages their weapon. <laughs> so good. I mean, realizing that the ochre jelly is immune to slashing damage and just multiplies, divides? Uh, when you hit it is also great, but a couple CR one half gray oozes are a little more, a lot more reasonable than a couple of CR two ochre jellies at level one or even level two. I think the only reason the designers went that way is the gold color, and I get it. I named this channel after an obscure color no one can spell or pronounce. Great branding, Doyle. But verdigris is both chromatic and metallic, so there you go. Deep nerd dragon pigment lore. Anyway, we can also stick with the ochre jellies and just say that they are pre-split, right? So they start with half as many hit points. They've been buried in these ruins for untold centuries, eating only what, like lizards and cave crickets. So maybe they're also in a weakened state and we take away one of those damage die as well. The magical ooze monsters created by an evil god don't need to conform to the principles of ecology and of our world, so don't overthink the dungeon's food chain too much, whatever you are running. It is worth considering taking a lesson from this one, though, when you are drawing your own maps in the future, and see how context and symmetry can create clues for the players naturally. This already discovered and opened secret door in E4 gives us a reason to check the opposite wall, and every other likely place in here for that matter. You can call for investigation checks or encourage your players to get creative with it and describe what they're doing. Checking for gaps in the stonework with like a dagger or spreading flour or sand around the edges of the room to check for a draft or just hitting everything with a tool to listen for hollow spots. When it's starting to feel like you're just rolling dice and comparing numbers a little bit too much and there's, what, eight secret doors, nine secret doors in here, try to use your imagination a little bit and encourage your players to do the same. Now, whichever ooze you end up using, they are both gonna be amorphous, right? So they can squeeze through a gap and in the process reveal a secret door as well. And maybe that's how the second one joins in after the first one's nearly dead, or one slinks away after taking some damage because otherwise it might kill everybody. Maybe while leaking under a door or emerging from a pile of rubble, they could also block the path, perhaps even dividing the party in the process. Remember the ochre jellies are slow, but large, taking up a 10 foot by 10 foot cube. And even the medium gray ooze could control one of these many narrow hallways. If the player characters aren't about to die, have some fun with that. Now, I love the exploration pillar of play and that sense of discovery that you can get. And I think it's often the weakest link in a lot of adventures and Dwarven Excavation just reinforces that impression because as written after a bunch of mostly empty rooms, the big payoff is a trap that might permanently kill the rogue and anybody else who happens to be standing nearby. Now you want an evil statue of the god of greed holding out a shiny rock with an evil smile that explodes when you touch it in your game. Cool, <laughs> I get it. But consider telegraphing that other exploded statue a little bit better maybe so it doesn't just seem like more rubble sitting there in the corner and maybe have the thing out front and center in the open not buried so it takes 40 hours to excavate. It does make it easy not to worry about all of this though because who the hell is going to do that? The whole thing is weird. I said earlier in this series I might run my eyeless in the dark instead of this one and I still think that's a pretty good idea. The downside is it doesn't have much to do with this adventure, but neither does Dwarven Excavation really, so you could just 
you know, merge Dormir Bronzeblast with these prospectors or the Rockseeker brothers and ease into things a little bit smoother, especially for new players. I am sure Halia Thornton would be very interested in that Basilisk egg at the end. The last fight can be a little tough in there, but it's still not a gotcha bomb after 40 hours of digging. Now, I know I'm biased, but showing the players that taking an optional side quest and helping these dwarves explore thoroughly brings nothing but pain and suffering feels not great. It might be the last time they're going to do anything that isn't on that job board, and who could blame them? So think about it, the full sample's free on the DM's Guild. The other thing that feels weird about Dwarven Excavation as is, is the orcs. It seems like a disconnected encounter just kind of tacked on to the end here, and to me it feels particularly strange that it only happens if the PCs do everything else in here first. If anything, I'd set it up so that if they don't go into the temple, they just tell the dwarves there's a white dragon flying around and head back to Phandalin, then that's the case where I would trigger the orc attack. Not when they're limping out of a pretty difficult adventure. And even matchup against orcs at level 2 is technically deadly, and at level 1, oh boy. Plus it explicitly comes out and says the orcs fight to the death. No retreat, no surrender, no negotiations, even though they are refugees on the run. I don't know, man. I don't love it. For game reasons and for story reasons, I think about changing it. That's another lesson, I guess. Never be afraid to change anything to suit your table. I recommend you take this orc encounter and put it in your pocket for when you need it, because essentially it is a random encounter that they placed here instead of just leaving it floating. This encounter being here does get the whole, you know, chased down from Ice Spire Peak and into the arms of Talos storyline in here early, though not very well, in my opinion, honestly. And I guess it makes sense that the orcs would want to take this place for their new home because they need one, but that could work in well, plenty of other locations as well, and it isn't exactly pivotal. So consider saving this for when the party is fully rested up and set to have an uneventful day of travel, maybe, or for whatever reason you're losing the table and players are looking at their phones, or you just feel like it's been a while since you all had a good combat. And when you do run it, consider having them all talking about Talos and Cryovane so the PCs might learn something, and this is all a bit more relevant. Yeah, I might have them talking in Orcish to reward players for investing in language proficiencies and spells, sure, but get that info in there. Because we want to keep pulling on those threads to keep these disparate pieces feeling like one cohesive adventure. And yes, Dwarven Excavation is not my favorite piece of this adventure, but that's okay because Nomengard makes up for it. Some Dungeon Masters don't agree with me, don't love this one, but I think it can be a ton of fun and I'm excited to talk about it next time. Until then, get out there, have fun, be kind to yourself, be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye.